dost thou think, because thou art virtuous, there shall be no more cakes and ale? This is Sir Toby Belch's legendary rebuttal to the puritanical Malvolio in William Shakespeare's Twelfth Night. In that play, Sir Toby Belch represents the eternal spirit of Carnival, an almost paganistic figure of festival fun. Sir Toby is continually drunk, playing pranks, singing and dancing in a boisterous manner, and generally louting about. His nemesis, Malvolio, the house steward, is a kind of Jobsworth killjoy who hates parties and continually attempts to shut down Sir Toby's fun. He represents the eternal spirit of Lent. He wants business as usual and he wants order to return to the household despite the fact that it is Christmas time. During the play he is relentlessly bullied and mocked in a manner that almost certainly crosses the line but at the end he vows I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. I'll be revenged on the whole pack of you. It has been most notoriously abused. And indeed, in real life, the Puritans did get their revenge by closing down the theatres after Oliver Cromwell came to power. And that included Shakespeare's Globe, which was closed in 1642 and remained closed for the next 355 years. Among other things, Shakespeare's play is about the irresistible clash between Carnival and Lent. On the side of Carnival, hedonistic excess, and on the side of Lent, life-denying sobriety. Shakespeare was a theatre man, so it seems to me that he was probably on the side of Carnival. But, nonetheless, he recognised that Lent was never going to be too far away, like a kind of avenging angel. Thus, the whirly gig of time brings in his revenges. Now, Lord Byron captured the essential dialectic between Carnival and Lent in Don Juan. Let us have wine and women, mirth and laughter, sermons and soda water the day after. The hangover will follow the knees up as day follows night. Now, it strikes me that this also seems to happen on a civilizational level. As I mentioned, the Elizabethan period was one of excess, featuring many a jig. In the era of Cromwell, singing and dancing and games of all sorts were banned. Then, in the era of the so-called party king, Charles II, excess was back in a big way. My name is... My name is... My name is Charles II. And this would accelerate and ultimately culminate in the gin craze, which followed the accession of William of Orange to the throne in 1688. The carnival conditions are captured by William Hogarth's famous prints, Beer Street and Gin Lane. The most shocking scene in Gin Lane is the mother in the foreground who has let her baby fall out of her arms to his presumed death below. If you look, she is not only addled with gin, but also riddled by syphilis, likely because she has been working as a prostitute. On the right hand side, another mother is feeding her baby gin. Now apparently these depictions were not an exaggeration. According to the Wikipedia entry on this print, in 1734, Judith Dufour reclaimed her two-year-old daughter, Mary, from the workhouse where she had been given a new set of clothes. She then strangled the girl and left her body in a ditch so that she could sell the clothes for one shilling and fourpence to buy herself some gin. In another case, an elderly woman, Mary Estwick, let a toddler burn to death while she slept in a gin-induced stupor. However, by the Victorian era, the pendulum had swung back the other way, and Victorian morality was such that Shakespeare's plays were censored and cleansed of material considered to be inappropriate. In 1885, 
all male homosexual acts were banned in Britain for the first time. Efforts were made to clamp down on prostitution. Schooling became incredibly strict, as witnessed, for example, in Jane Eyre, who is branded a sinner and a liar and made to stand on a stool all day for the crime of dropping her slate. You know, the slates they used to, uh, you know, use their chalk on. Also, during this period of Lent, the police force massively expanded and criminals were put into imposing neo-Gothic prisons intended to strike the fear of God into the sinners. Although, of course, these prisons were not harsh enough for our friend Thomas Carlyle. However, by the Roaring Twenties, Carnival was back again with a vengeance, as Cole Porter sang. In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was a look of something shocking, but now God knows anything goes. Could offer to who once knew better words, now only use for letter words, writing prose. Anything goes. If driving fast cars you like, if low bars you like, if old hymns like, if they live you like, if may West you like, or me unrest you like, why nobody will oppose. When every night the set that smart is intruding at new parties in studio, anything goes. By the 1950s, people in Britain were getting their powdered egg rationed to them by the government, of course and notably social attitudes had become much more conservative again. And this brings me on to the past 30 years or so. If you were a teenager in the 1990s, like me, you will know that unmistakably we grew up in a time of hedonistic excess. Anything goes ramped up to its fullest, possibly ever in history. It strikes me that the pendulum has been swinging back to Lent with some rapidity for a while now. But the problem is that our current Puritans are themselves degenerates. This is a situation that cannot sustain, because the spirit of Lent, which is an irresistible force, tends, as we have seen, to, let's just say, pull in a conservative direction. Lent cannot brook showing kids quote-unquote kink at a pride event. So it seems to me that at some point these tools of censorship that we've been seeing which have been used for liberal ends will actually be co-opted and used in a conservative direction at some point in the next 20 or 30 years. That would be my prediction. Thus the wordy gig of time brings in his revenges. By Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them. You will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now. Be sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you really like my content, maybe consider joining the channel or donating or maybe even buy a mug. I am grateful for all of your support. Now get out.